Hello, listener. So, you like scary movies? Well, it is a creepy night, and with all those crazy lunatics out there, well, you really shouldn't be alone. Ooh, you look so freaked out right now. <laughs> now I suggest you listen very carefully. Subscribe to Class Horror Cast, or I'll gut you like a fish. Enjoy the show. I'll be watching. <laughs> Inspired with filmmaking during weekly trips to the theatre to see the latest horror releases, by age 14 William Malone was making home movies with an 8mm camera and designing monster masks for him and his friends for Halloween. At 19 he moved to Los Angeles to become a rock star, but upon a friend's request it led him to work for Don Post Studios and it was in fact William who sculpted the mask he used for Michael Myers in the original Halloween. After attending UCLA to study directing, he wrote and directed Scared to Death and followed a few years later with Creature in 1985. For over a decade after, he directed episodes of hit shows such as Freddy's Nightmares, Tales from the Crypt, Honey I Shrunk the Kids and Sleepwalkers. In 1999, Joel Silver and Robert Zemeckis approached William under the newly formed company Dark Castle Entertainment and wanted him to direct a remake of William Castle House on Haunted Hill. The film has since become a cult classic and put William among horror royalty. In 2002, he returned with Fear.com, which has since gained a cult following among the community. Upon the request of Mick Garris, he directed an episode of Masters of Horror in 2006, called The Fair-Haired Child. In 2008, he funded, wrote and directed his own movie, Parasomnia, which is essentially a horror twist on Sleeping Beauty. Up next is my conversation with a true master of horror. We talk about his career, some of his amazing prop collection, and what the future holds for William. You won't want to miss this one. Can you remember the first horror movie or, I guess, related experience you might have had? Oh, gosh. I think the first horror movie that I remember is my mother took me when I was a little kid to see Creature from the Black Lagoon in 3D. And, uh, I mean, I was really small, and I don't know why she took me to see that movie, but it it scared the bejesus out of me and... uh, uh, yeah, I, I remember spending most of the film ducking underneath the, the seats. <laughs> but I remember going home and thinking, wow, that was, that was something. Yeah, that was okay. That was all right. Yeah, so. w- would you say that um, I guess some people have different experiences. Some people stray away from that kind of movie after an experience like that. Did you go more into that genre? Yeah, I think, you know, that really, uh, I really enjoyed it. You know, I re- enjoyed the scare and stuff like that. And, um, and you know, and I used to listen to a lot of, for some reason, when I was a real little kid, I used to listen to a lot of classical music. And a lot of it was like things like Night on Bald Mountain, and <laughs> you know, so it was like kind of scary music. And, and yeah, 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 I just, it, it made me very... Uh, 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 excited to see that stuff. So yeah, I, I wanted to see it after that. And a lot of times when my parents wouldn't take me to see them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess from that point then, when you, when you got interested in, in making movies and stuff, can you remember some of the first things that you maybe might've tried to shoot? Well, you know, I, I, I guess my background for when I was a little kid, I started making monster masks Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, and, and when I was really young, instead of asking for toys, I'd always ask my parents for clay to, so I could make my toys because there weren't any toys. Now, now you can get everything. You can get like any monster you want, you know, is out there someplace. But when I was a kid, there was nothing. I mean, you know, you, you, there was no kind of monster kits or any of that stuff. So, so yeah, I, I would make my, you know, models and stuff like that. And, and then, um, and play with them and stuff. And, and uh, Mm -hmm. I remember building a fly laboratory, you know, Nice <laughs> stuff like that, and, and uh, but yeah, I mean, um, 
making my first film, I guess, was really influenced by all of that stuff when I was a kid, you know, so, and I had been making little eight millimeter movies. I remember making, you know, I'd never finished it because the film was too expensive, but I made like a version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This is probably when I was about 12 years old, I think. Wow. You know, yeah. Do you still have any of that stuff from back then? Bits and pieces of it have survived. That's about it, you know, And, and I've got one very funny piece, which is where I, I, come on, I'm like dressed in a suit. I think I'm Walt Disney or something. <laughs> you know, I'm like 12 or 13 years old, you know, and I'm introducing my movie. Of course, there's no sound, so you can't hear what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> as regards um, making monster masks and, and your own figures and stuff, was this something that you just picked up and it was self-taught? Just out of your I think it was mostly self-taught, yeah, yeah, because I'd been playing with clay since I was a really little kid, mm-hmm. and uh, and like I said, I mean, I wanted them to make monsters and so forth, and I remember I made my first foam latex mask, which is, looking back on it, that's pretty high-tech technology, yeah. and I made my first one when I was 14 years old, wow. and I remember taking it into the school and showing the, the art teacher, and he just kind of looked at it with a puzzled look going... Uh huh. <laughs> what was it? Can you remember? Uh, he, well, I think it was uh, a Dick Smith. It was a copy of a Dick Smith makeup. Yeah, nice. from my, I'd seen on television. You know, nice. something I think it was in Famous Monsters or something. It was a. Uh, uh, it was. Um, what was it called? It was it was something where half the guy's face is missing, you know. And then I did mm-hmm. another one where I think he he did like a hunchback sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It was for a show called um, what was this show? Uh, Raul Dahl show. Um, a Way Out. It was okay. called Way yeah. Out. Yeah, which was like a, a, a kind of Twilight Zone sort of uh, copy, I think. And interestingly enough, Larry Cohen was one of the writers on that show who I later became friends with. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's like everything <laughs> comes full circle. It, it does. It's amazing. Um, and did, and I, I should also point out that when I was 14, I called Bud Westmore on the phone, you know, the head of the makeup department. Yeah. I found his phone in the phone, or his number in the phone book and just called him. You know? and, and it's actually on the internet. You can find it on YouTube. If you look up Bill Malone and Bud Westmore, it's on the YouTube. Really? I, yeah. I want to say I've, I've seen that, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. But yeah. it, that does sound familiar. <laughs> It's it's very funny. I, I'm really gosh gee willikers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I um, did you get many requests? And I guess you were like the the kid to go to at Halloween, considering you can make these things. No, not really. Only from adults because when when my friends thought I was just a weirdo, you know, because I grew up in a town with, I was probably one of two monster kids in, in all of yeah. my town, you know, but I do remember like one of my dad's friends wanted me to uh, make him up as Dracula. So I did a halfway decent Dracula makeup on him, on him. And I remember apparently he got punched out at a party because he was too scary and scared one of the, <laughs> one of the other party goers. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's a good thing. I guess that's As regards your makeup. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, at 1920, you moved to L.A., right? 1920? No, not that. <laughs> no, I mean at age 19 or 20. <laughs> when I was 20, yeah, I, I moved out, yes. Uh, actually, I came out in the summer of love, 1969, you know. when the, <laughs> how, how was that experience for you? Like when you first got there, um, I guess, you, you know, being interested in all this stuff, looking to make movies different things like that when you first land in la what is that like well you know like i said i came out in the summer of love and i came out i literally had i think i had a hundred dollars in my pocket which of course wouldn't last long even back then yeah and and uh boy it was it was tough but it was uh, i was fascinated of course by movies and and uh you know and stuff but i actually came out really to be a rock and roll star uh, you know, uh-huh. that's what i wanted to do is play play music and stuff and then um 
and then and then I started rekindling my interest in in you know makeup and that stuff, and I tried to get jobs doing makeup and um I worked on various things and I got a job at a company called Don Post Studios that made monster masks and I stayed there for uh from nineteen seventy four until nineteen eighty so which is when I made my first movie yes yeah and Am I correct in saying something that a lot of people probably wouldn't know uh, is your connection with the original Michael Myers mask? Yeah, I sculpted the original Captain Kirk mask, which became the Michael Myers mask. And uh, uh, basically, I mean, at the things I was doing at Don Post Studios, that was really a minor event. And I really had no idea that it was going to take off and be anything, you know. And uh, we had gotten the license to do the Star Trek characters. Uh-huh. And we I didn't really want to do Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock because I thought, you know, people want to want the monsters, you know. So, yeah, yeah. But, but, but we, we sculpted them. And I, I did, I did, uh, I think I did both of them, Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock. And, and um, yeah. And then I remember one day when John Carpenter and his crew came in and they wanted, a uh, uh, of Captain Kirk painted white and the hair sprayed black. And I said, okay. And contrary to popular belief, and I see this all the time, people say his hair was not black. It was black. You go back and look at the movie and it's black. And then it turns sort of the Captain Kirk color, the sort of mm-hmm. uh, blonde later in the film is because all the, the black lacquer that we put in the hair came out. Yeah. So. <laughs> There's so many debates over that mask. Yeah, I know. What I I love is I I posted pictures what I which I shot the day of that, and I posted pictures of it. You know, this is I'm talking about 1979, uh-huh. whenever, whenever it was 1977. Uh, I posted pictures that I took at the time, and people were saying that's not the original. And you know, as so you go, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you've got those diehard fans, and I think there's so much. Um, I guess information out there now that a lot yeah. of times these stories kind of go all I know, over people place. people see stuff on the internet or they watch the movie and they think they're you know absolute experts on it and it's just it's amusing actually you know yeah people oh, become just, the i can only quote peter laurie you fat bloated idiots <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true um so when when scared to death came about was that something that you had been brewing or how did that all come together originally? Well, um, first of all, I should tell my impetus for actually becoming a director was I'd been making little films, as I mentioned, when mm-hmm. I was a little kid and I loved movie making and I had made a, a little like silly movie called Night, Tur- Night Turkey, which was a mm-hmm. takeoff on the TV show Night Stalker and uh, Bob Short, the effects whiz, played Carl Kornchek <laughs> instead of Kolchek, Kornchek. And, uh, and I, we shot that on video and I, I, I had a big fun doing it. And then at, while I was at Don Post Studios, all these directors would come in for monster movies that they were working on. And I could tell that every one of those directors, with the exception of John Carpenter, maybe one or two others, they all hated horror films Mm -hmm. and they were only doing them because they had the job and they thought, you know, I I gotta go do this. And I thought that's not the way to make a horror movie. You've got to, you know, love what you're doing. And so when I, when about 1980, I was thinking about leaving Don Post. I thought, you know, I want to make my own monster movie or make my own film. And so, and I, I thought to myself, what can I bring to it? And I thought, you know, you need to have something in your movie that's, that stands out. Yeah. And I thought, what can I bring to it that somebody else would have to pay a lot of money for? And I thought a monster so I can spend some time. So I, I spent, I think about three or four months building the monster suit and uh, for the Sinjin or the first scared to death. And um, you know, and that's how, that's how it came about. And then I, you know, I left Don Post and mortgaged my house and sold the cat and dog and you know, <laughs> raised the money. And <laughs> Where do you think, um, just when you mentioned there about, uh, and, and I think you may have done this probably several times throughout your career, and it's something that maybe a lot of people don't know. You know, something like moving to L.A. Um, to become a rock and roll star, um, mortgaging your house, using your life savings to, to fund 
your own projects. That um, I, I guess that that confidence in your work, or maybe the passion behind your work, is that something that you always had? You know, I, I've always been sort of uh, uh, foolhardy, I guess, or just, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've never been afraid of taking chances. I yeah. mean, because I think that you have to, you have to risk failure and you have to risk disaster in order to get anything, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, looking back on it, I mean, it was a very foolhardy thing, although it's probably less foolhardy back then than it is now because back uh-huh. then there was uh you know you had the drive-in movie circuit you had a burgeoning uh vhs or home video the thing that was happening uh-huh. so there was a fairly good chance that if your movie was vaguely watchable you'd be able to sell it and uh we were fortunate enough when i made scared to death that we, the distributors that we hooked up with were kind of low end distributors and they were, they had, hadn't been doing it long enough to be really criminals yet. So, <laughs> so we, we actually made money on that movie. So I actually made my money back and the investors made their money back. Um, I have to tell you a funny story about investing in that movie. Uh, you know, I took my life savings and put into it, but uh, there was a, a guy named John Janata who was an architect. He was a great guy. I love John. Um, and his his sister is in scared to death plays the the sort of character with the glasses and stuff. Tony, Tony Janata. Anyway, he saw that I was casting her and he wanted to be part of the movie. So he wanted to invest in it. So he said, well, I'll put in $10,000 into your movie. And I said, great, you know, and he said, he, and I said, when can I get the check? He said, well, just come over. I'll, I'll have it in uh, uh, at my office in Westwood. So this West was like, I don't know, an hour, 45 minutes away from where I lived. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll drive over. When I get there, John's not there, and he's pinned the check with no envelope, just pinned wow. the check to the door on the outside of his office. This is like a hallway of people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I said, you're my kind of guy. That's a ballsy move. <laughs> <laughs> so... So that movie comes out, and like you said, you make some money back. Uh, everything went relatively well. Immediately, did you have the desire then to get right back into making? Well, yeah, movie? yeah, I wanted to make more films, but of course, you know, I mean, the movie did well. I mean, it, did, it made like number sixteen on the charts, but nobody was knocking on my door, going, "Hey, come and make movies for us," you know. So, you know, I basically starved for the next three or four years and I, you know, was able to survive making, you know, selling, you know, making props and, and, uh, um, you know, uh, and I shot some video, uh, I was shooting it as a cameraman for Disney cable shooting like a uh, reality things and stuff like that. So, you know, cooking shows. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Do you think that that's, um, part of the process for, I don't even want to say um, directors, but I guess um, the artistic type or the creative type of person, is that kind of something that they're going to have to expect in that journey that you will have to, like you said, you you know, there's times where it's going to be tough. You might have to branch off and maybe do things that are not what your heart desires to get you to that next I, I, yeah, I think unless you're extremely lucky, I think that's that's what has to happen. You you have to, I guess they used to call it paying your dues. You yeah. know, it's a, it's it's what you have to go through. And uh, but it's good because it, it gives you a more of a perspective on things. I think when when the opportunities do show themselves, you know, you you can grab them and throttle them for all they're worth. Yeah. yeah. So. Um... After Scared to Death, then your next movie was Creature, right? Right, which was uh, shot as as Titan Find, and uh, that uh, that came about because I had bumped into a guy named Bill Dunn, who was like a, a burgeoning producer. He had never made anything, but he was very enthusiastic, and and he had bumped into a guy named Moshe Diamant at a party. Who was a he was part of that so sort of crazed Israelis producers that came over in the late seventies, you know, with Canon and all those guys. Uh-huh. And, uh, he wanted to make his mark and, uh, he, he, 
I don't know where he got his money from, but he would just, uh, you know, he was able to say yes. And, and we, we uh, got into production on creature. This is like I say, after about four years of struggling and, and he said that he basically came to us and said, well, I want to make a movie like your first movie scared to death, but I want to set it in space. Well, that's alien, you know? So, yeah. 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 So, so uh, I said, okay. Uh, you know, at that point I was willing to do anything to make a movie. So, yeah. And did you have, um, did you feel settled into the role at that point? I guess, was there any nerves or anything like that? Uh, not so much on that film. Of course, scared to death my first day of shooting. I mean, I remember the night before shooting, I was terrified. You know, I go, what am I going to say to anybody, you know? But by the time I got to uh, uh, Creature, I realized that the, the first day of sh- shooting is always the most nerve wracking. Once you get past that, you're fine. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, I mean, Creature was a much, obviously a much bigger production. You know, I mean, uh, we had, I think we built 24 sets and, you know, it was all on stage and, and uh, there was a lot of elements to it. So, uh, you know, um, and it was a very grueling uh, shoot, actually. Um, I would probably be, I, I was going to avoid asking this question, but I guess uh, anybody who listens to the show will probably um, freak out at me if I don't ask. But uh, you were This has anything to do with Klaus Kinski? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It does, in fact. Um, w- was he or is he as crazy as some of the stories that are out there? Let me put it this way. In in Creature, in Titan Fine, he plays a crazy person. And off camera, he was 10 times crazier wow. than the part he was playing. Yeah. Wow. I mean, Klaus Kinski um, was a madman. I mean, uh, and and... Unfortunately, not in a very good way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he, uh, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, the first day I met him, we, uh, we were, we were walking out to the set of, of uh, the planet surface and uh, mm-hmm. he put his arm around me and goes, Bill, I just want you to know that when Natasha was 12, I raped her. And I went, whoa. What what am I supposed to do with that? You know, Whoa. and and things went downhill from there. You know, uh, yeah, he was. Uh, 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 another thing, we were in sometime in the middle of production. We had had a luncheon at a place called Ma Misson, which was a sort of high end restaurant uh-huh. in Beverly Hills, and all the producers were there and everybody. And and uh, Klaus was there, and he had this girl with him who was probably. 14 if she was a day christ <laughs> and and she went up to she left for a moment to go to the restroom and i said klaus where did you find her and he goes oh i hang around the school yards and i i, so I the bizarre. way he said it i knew he was telling me the truth I, oh man so so uh, bizarre now i i have to preface this by saying her uh, not preface it but just say that klaus was actually there was never a part for him in the movie. This is one of those things where the producers just, you know, came to me and said, uh, "Klaus Kinski's in your movie," and right, uh, okay. I said, "But we're shooting in two weeks." Yeah, well, he's in your movie. I said, "There's no part for Klaus. There is now." <laughs> so you've just got to come up with something. So I had to write a part for him to fit in the into the film. So I, I guess but crazy look, works. <laughs> yeah, look, he he lit up the screen when he was on camera. Yeah. Uh, there's no question. He was he was a brilliant actor. But uh, the question is, is it worth it? And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, he, he's a character that pops up all the time online. Uh, you know, people talk about different rumors and stories. And a lot of them, well, I'm not sure, but a lot of them might be just internet rumors. But he, he so many people seem to be interested in him because he's such a, a strange character on and off screen. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, I... I yeah, he 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 did light up the, the screen, but yeah, I don't know. We used to have arguments between every take. I mean, he'd want to argue. Really? I, I, I'm not a person. I'm not a person who gets into arguments, but he would like want to have an argument between every take, and a, uh, and like a genuine like an argument. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and um, uh, I remember that. Uh, 
you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a yeller. I'm, I'm not, but I remember about day, I had him for about a week and I remember on day four, we had tried everything to like get it, get him under control. We called his agent. We called, you know, everybody. And I think on day four, I remember I, I winked at the cameraman and I turned around to Klaus. I just started screaming at him, you know, I, and told him he was going to hit his marks. He was going to be there on time and he wasn't going to mess with anybody. And he was a pussycat for the next day and a half. But oh, wow. Had him, so. Yeah. So he just wanted somebody just to like, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, um, that's who he was. So. Such a strange guy. So from, from there you went on, you directed um, a couple of episodes of Freddy's Nightmares tales from the crypt mm-hmm. and different things how did that differ from i guess first of all um w- without trying to sound rude but you so you do your feature films and then you kind of go to to a lot of tv stuff for a while how did that differ from from films and was well, there lucky you know i i i've never you know had a big ego about my my work and the thing you know because i, I think I think no matter what you do, it's just a job. I don't care if you're Paul McCartney or, mm-hmm. or uh, anybody, you're just, it's just a job and you're doing a job and that's what it's about. And uh, when I, when it came to, uh, um, to doing uh, uh, Freddy's, I mean, I hadn't worked in, in a while and I was happy to be actually shooting anything. And, and Freddy's actually, that was a kind of a good experience because it was an opportunity. I, I, in when I took film school, I never actually took like film school where you shot a bunch of stuff. I, you know, I just mm-hmm. took like classes in directing and that kind of stuff, but, but actually not actually filming stuff. Uh, but when I came to do um, Freddy's, it was a show that the producers really didn't care about. You know, it was like a cash cow for them. It played yeah. at like two o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the morning or something. Nobody cared. The producers didn't care. So I took the uh, 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 the opportunity to just try any wacky idea I had. You know, now the shows were very cheap. They're awful. You know, they're terrible shows. They you know, had no production value, but they didn't care either. So I could like try and try different effects and different ideas that I had. Uh-huh. And that was actually really good. Cause uh, um, you know, and also the show we were just sometimes doing like an hour show in four and a half days, you know? Yeah. And so you really had to be fast on your feet and come up with really quick solutions to things. So that was a good training ground for doing stuff later on. Uh, and then right after that, um, uh, I, did uh, a show called Dark Justice, which was kind of the same thing. It was another show that yeah, was, yeah. I think, was, that was like in four days or four and a half days hours. I mean, one of those I remember I shot like a a, a full day on the stage, and then we went out to location and shot a big shoot 'em up in the park, and then at dusk we shot a walk and talk, and it was just like so fast, you know. We, we got into a thing. Actually, there was a a bet between myself and some of the other directors as to how few shots you could shoot a scene in and still be able to edit it. <laughs> I'd actually got it down to one. Wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. Where, you know, you could still edit the scene if you had to cut something out. <laughs> I guess, and I never really thought of it that way, but that was really good experience. And, and I don't want you to think when I, when I mentioned the TV thing that uh, I was talking about it in a bad light. Um, oh no, it's it's fine. Like I, I, you know, I know what it is and what it was, and and, the, and you know, and some TV. I did some TV. I'm very proud of. So, well, I I would include a lot of those in that, um, because I think, and especially now, all these years on, things like Freddy's Nightmares are um, are looked upon very fondly. Um, Dark Justice is another one. Tales from the Crypt, obviously. Um, Sleepwalkers, all those things. I think. Maybe at the time, like you said, you know, the producers or whatever didn't really care and it was kind of a cash cow. But I think a a good percentage of the, the horror community, especially, a lot of those things are regarded now as um, yeah. time capsules. They're like horror gems, I guess. Yeah. Um, which I which I think is is amazing, really, to see. And when you did return to um, the big screen, you came back with... Uh, a, my my favorite. I'm gonna fanboy out here a, a tiny <laughs> bit. This the House on Haunted Hill, 
um, that came out in 1999 is probably in my top three favorite movies of all time. Oh, it, God bless you. <laughs> it has, I don't, I can't even pinpoint, I, I'm not sure exactly how to explain it. It just has this feeling, um, how it's shot, the characters, everything about it, the backstory, the sets, everything just has this feel for me um, that I could, I, I've definitely watched this film in excess of probably three or 400 times. <laughs> um <laughs> It's one of those have movies you, I just... Have you, have you considered therapy? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people ask me that, actually. Um, how So to go from, you know, all this TV work, how does somebody come back into the director's seat with this, you know, huge uh, William Castle remake thing? And th- this was like a big thing back then. Well, well, it was actually, uh, it was sort of a, tra- uh, a transition, and the transition really was that going back to Freddy's, uh, I'd worked with uh, a producer, a director, producer, director named uh, Gil Adler. Mm -hmm. And Gil was, when he was doing his Freddy's, he was, um, uh, he was shooting his first time he'd ever directed anything. And he liked the stuff that I had been doing. So he asked me to sit in with him while he was directing his first thing and just give him any notes or stuff. And he was, he did fine. I didn't have to say anything to him, but, but we became good friends. And then when, when um, uh, he was, he then later got a job doing tales from the crypt as one of the line producers on that. And uh, you know, and, so they had done five seasons of Tales from the Crypt mm-hmm. and uh, they, they had gone through all the quote famous directors. <laughs> so they were looking for anybody who could do horror. And he remembered me and he said, well, come and do an episode of Tales from the Crypt for me. And um, they sent me this. I remember they sent me the script. And when I read the script, I mean, tears came to my eyes. Cause I went, I know how to do this. This is like a godsend. I know exactly what this show should be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes you don't feel that way, but I went in there and it was, um, again, a show that was shot in four days, but because I knew it so well, I felt like I had tons of time and I went in there and, and directed it. And um, it was one of the, really one of the best experiences that I ever had because uh, again, the producers at this point, didn't care about the show because it had been on for five seasons and it was just like, yeah, go, go make some, as long as you come in on time on budget. So they left me alone. And, uh, um, it, uh, the, um, a little, just a backstory on it. I don't know if you've seen the episode, but it's very, um, uh, kind of down and dirty in the sense that it doesn't have like, a uh, uh, a lot of set pieces in it. It's a, the, the sets are very sort of barren, which was by design, in fact, because this was a show where they prided themselves on, you know, big everything, yeah. you know, and I, but I didn't want that for this episode. And so uh, uh, Greg Melton, who was the art director, who I'd become friendly with on other shows, um, I, I've said, Greg, I want you to, and this is a good tip for filmmakers. I said, I want you to draw up, designs for the most elaborate set you've ever seen for this show. <laughs> and so I said, just go completely art deco. So, you know, and I knew full well that they would never let me have this. Uh-huh. Right. So we brought it in, into the producer's office and, and we sat down and said, well, this is what we want to make. And they, and I, and I could just see their hair, they're, <laughs> they're pulling their hair out. Oh my God, we can't make this. How's this going? How much is this going to cost? He gave them some number and they went, no, 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 no. And I said, okay, well, I have a B plan. If you let me do the B plan, uh, I think you'd be happy with it. So they say, yeah, I just, whatever, just as long as it's not this expensive. <laughs> so, so on that, actually, I did the exact opposite. I was going in there and I was actually telling the, like the, um, the, the the prop people and the and the set designers says take that out take that out take that out you know I don't want any of this you know so we got it down to a really barren set you know there wasn't even any lights in the set it was like we I had them like cut holes in the side of the walls and stuff so we could blow lights through them and have them move and stuff so anyway it was a great experience do you 
do you think that helps? Like, I, I know in modern day um, companies like Blumhouse Pictures, they, um, they obviously they're lower budget horror films, I guess. Um, but a lot of directors seem to come back. Uh, a lot of writers seem to come back and say that they they kind of get left alone. They're allowed to be creative. They yeah. get maybe five million dollars, potentially ten, depending on the movie. And they're just kind of let loose. They're allowed to be creative. And I think they encourage them to be more inventive or whatever. Do you think mm-hmm. that's a good approach? Well, yeah. I mean, I think you have to trust, you know, uh, really do your your research on the director. But I think, yeah, I think that unless you see them really going off the rails, I think that you have to let them do their job just like anybody. I mean, you know, you have to let them do what they do best, you know? So it's, you know, I've certainly done my best work when left alone. I was, I had yeah. No question. So, um, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, so anyway, that, that sort of launched me, you know, that the, um, uh, um, the producers saw the episode and Bob Zemeckis said it was, mm-hmm. went back and said it was the best tales from the crypt ever, ever shot. And of course, I don't believe that, but, but the, the, but the fact that he said that suddenly I had agents coming out, you know, out the door and, you know, had a lot of offers to do stuff. So, you know, it was, it was a watershed for me. It was a, what got my career jump start. So. And when you agreed to, to, um, to do the project, instantly did you have a, a vision in mind or was it something that had to be refined and refined in pre-production you're talking about the tales from the crypt no from um house on haunted hill house on haunted hill yeah well what happened actually i'd been thinking for a long time that i wanted to do a ghost movie yeah uh because i really had a feeling i just had a feeling in my heart i said ghost movies are going to come back hot and heavy because there hasn't been one in a long yeah. time. And I, and the last one I think was years and years ago, you know, and I said, this is, this is prime real estate, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's do a ghost movie. And, and then at the same time, I got a call. I had done a couple other things since the crypt episode for, for Bob Zemeckis and, and Joel and, and the other producers. And they, and, uh, and Joel called me and said, uh, we bought the rights to Terry to from Terry Castle for the William Castle films and we want to do a remake of house on haunted hill and i said yes i'm your man so uh they gave me that and um you know so yeah i mean i had a i had a pretty good idea what i wanted to do there was some hiccups along the way because uh dick bb who is the writer mm-hmm. um you know he had a little problem with the uh the <laughs> mm-hmm. with the drink and uh I, I let him go, uh, uh, well, myself and the producers let him just go off and, and uh, do a draft. And he spent like six months doing the draft. And by the time, he, he, I think what he did is he wrote the actual draft like the night before he was supposed to deliver it because it really wasn't very good. And uh, the studio was actually going to pull the plug on it. And I said, no, guys, let me let me just work with him. I said, give me a couple of weeks to work with him. And uh, so I took Dick and we sat and I said, let's go watch the original house on Haunted Hill and let's find everything we like about it and put it in the movie. And I said, then we'll fix the things that we think could be better. And that's what we did. So we tried to stay true to the William Castle thing. I said, but, but uh, um, let's try and do that. So we drafted a script and uh, basically the way it broke down is I wrote all of, pretty much all of the scary stuff and Dick wrote pretty much all of the character driven stuff. And that was fine. That was fine with me. So, uh, uh, so the studio were actually going to pull the plug on the project completely. Yeah. They, yeah. Because they didn't wow. like the script. Wow. So, but then when we turned in the new script, they said, yes, says we like this. Let's, let's go make this. Was it tough so. to get that, um, blend of because uh, i feel like the movie has a perfect amount of you know gore there's some humor in there uh good scares was it hard to balance well, all that well, out well look uh you know i've got to be straight with you the the thing is uh what they told me originally was they wanted something like my tales from the crypt episode so it was mm-hmm. originally going to be a very dark scary yeah. movie that was our intention about two weeks before shooting i started getting 
script pages or notes from uh, the, the writers of the TV show Friends. And I went, what is this? <laughs> you know, and it became very clear to me. And they said, oh, you don't have to pay attention to that. And I knew, you know, when they say that, that means you really have to pay attention yeah. to that because if you don't, you're fired. So I, so I, I, it became very clear to me that what they really wanted was Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. They wanted right. uh, uh, something that was funny, but the scares were scary. And so that's what, uh, that's what I tried to do. I said, let's, let's see if we can make that balance and make it so that the scares are still fu- scary and, and yeah. people are still, you know, have some comedy in it. So that that was my approach, uh, and that was the first movie uh, released by Dark Castle. And did you know? I guess during the whole process, even I, I would ima- I would suppose by filming and everything, did you know that this movie was going to be as big as it was? Like it got a Halloween release. They had the promo thing with the scratch cards. <laughs> Well, I, I really had no idea when it was finished and we previewed it. I had a pretty good idea that it was going to do fairly well because you know, you've got Warner Brothers behind it and, you know, they're going to do their promotion thing. And and then they ran an ad on, I think it was Super Bowl Sunday oh, on wow, the Super yeah. Bowl. And, you know, I said, well, that's, you know, well, that's going to bring some people in. And, and I think the movie actually would have done much better, except what happened was... Uh, uh, Spielberg's company heard that we were making House on Haunted Hill. And of course, they had a lot more money to throw at it. So they made The Haunting at the same time. Mm-hmm. And they were able to get it out first. You know, And I don't know if they got it out first because of that or because Warner Brothers backed off so that they didn't, they didn't want to offend Steven. So anyway, my movie got released second. We actually were in the production long before The Haunting. And... Uh, uh, but Haunting got released first and got bad reviews and, you know, I think it hurt our movie. So, but, but, you know, still we did really well. I have no complaints, you know, yeah. but I think it would have done much better had it even than what it did. Yeah. It's, it's strange. Cause I guess at the time it's kind of a pity, but in hindsight, I love seeing um, a movie like this stick around. Like, I personally don't like The Haunting and there's a lot of people out there who do not like that movie and I feel like it never really gets brought up or talked about whereas House on Haunted Hill you know some people might say I don't like the humor this and that that movie gets talked about so so much I mean and especially when you see a company like um, Shout Factory or Scream Factory you know they do their collector's edition and the thing is sold out and now, if you live outside the States and you want to get a copy, it's going to cost you like 80 to 100 bucks. Oh, no. Yeah. And it's just, I'm lucky enough I actually have one. But, um, you know, I, I love seeing that. I love seeing work like that. That Because I think you can feel the passion. You can feel that um, there was someone in charge of this project who actually cared about what came out. You know, it yeah. wasn't just let me well, sign yeah, for I a mean, check. And the one whatever. thing I will say about myself is I'm very passionate about horror films, and you know, and, and particularly that film, I didn't want to have the people who you know remember the William Castle one be all mad at me for making uh-huh. it. You know, of course, there are always people who of course. are like that, but but you know, I, I, that was my intention. It was to try and honor the, the William Castle's version of it, and uh, nicely uh, uh, a great. I got a great gift. Terry Castle gave me William Castle's original um, uh, uh, script cover from uh, wow. House on Oak Hill. So it was very close. It's William Castle on it. It's all leather. It's great. That's a cool piece. I, I believe yeah. you're a, a somewhat of a prop collector. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been collecting props since I first got out here, really. Yeah. And it really never started. I wasn't actually started to be a prop collector. What happened was somebody came over to my house once. I think I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it may have been like a, uh, a, a creature from the black lagoon hand. And they had one of the originals and they said, Oh, I know you like this stuff. So here have this. And then it just sort of blossomed from there. And I just started collecting more and more stuff. And it was at a time when the studios were throwing stuff out. So you yeah. know, I just did. I said, this stuff's too cool to be through, put in a dumpster. So, you know. Is, is it still something you partake in now or? Well, not so much because you can't get any of that stuff yeah. anymore. You know, when I first came out here, uh, there was like a, 
a sort of small circle. It's probably like 10 or 15 people who collected the stuff and we just traded. It was like trading cards and stuff. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it was easy to get. Cause like I said, the studios were throwing stuff out and, you know, uh, you know, you know, you'd get, and you'd pay somebody like $10 for something. <laughs> Yeah, which is, I think when people, uh, for anybody listening, you have um, a really cool video on YouTube um, taking people through some of your props and different things that you've got. And it's crazy to hear some of the stories and some of the things that were going to be thrown away and you gave someone a couple of bucks to get them. And now people would probably pay tens of thousands Oh yeah. To have those well, things. you know, I mean, like I said, it was actually more fun back then when the stuff was worthless because it was, you know, yeah. it was just, yeah, just fun stuff. In fact, that's one of the reasons, as you know, I probably sold Robbie the robot. I had the original uh-huh. from forbidden planet and I sold him uh, mainly because he'd become like a big weight. I, I really loved him and I had him for 40 years, but he'd become where I was starting to worry about like when I left the house, was the house going to burn down or was there, you know, there was some, yeah. and it became just this huge responsibility, you know, and, and you just kind of go, okay, well that's, that's just not why I got it in the first place. So. Yeah. That's actually a, um, an interesting point. I never really thought about that, that it is kind of more fun when it's, yeah, yeah yeah it's for the fun of it yeah that was more the fun of it yeah i mean you know I, somebody come over with the hand from the original thing or something and you go yeah. okay great you know yeah have you got any cool I remember, props? Tur- I remember turning down a uh, one sheet to day the earth stood still because they wanted 12 dollars for it well, that's ridiculous. Oh, wow <laughs> wow do, do you have anything cool from um house on haunted hill I, I actually have one of the cabinets that was down in the basement, you know, of the, yeah. Thing. I've got the one that's got the little baby in it, you know, oh, the and, worst and one. I also have the, uh, the prop of the, uh, the girl that's underwater with the, you know, the Dick Smith makeup that's amazing. thing. Yeah, I have that. And I was able to, I, I could have gotten more stuff. I mean, they offered me the horse and rider, you know, in the case, but it was so huge. I went, there was no place I could have put it. So that's crazy that that stuff like that um and and that's kind of uh i i do collect props and little things and it's always from um i see a lot of the collectors online it maybe feeds into a little bit of what you're talking about where sometimes people want to acquire something just because it's expensive or it's so sought after whereas um I love this movie, so I would look for things from this movie. Or I love that movie that other people don't really like, but something from that would mean more to me than having Luke Skywalker's lightsaber, just because. Oh yeah. Everybody yeah. wants that or whatever. Um, is it true that Marilyn Manson was considered for the role of the Doctor in House on Haunted Hill? I don't recall that we ever considered him for that role. Uh, uh, I had actually already always had uh, Jeff Combs in mind for the doctor, you know, for Vanica, you know, and because I had worked with him on uh, a show called Perversions of Science, yeah. which was a spinoff on uh, Tales from the Crypt, and we'd become good friends. And and uh, it's interesting, his part, because people think he's like in, in the movie, like as a, a major character, and he's really just in a few, probably less than a minute and a half of that movie, but... But, you know, his presence is so big, I guess. It, yeah, you know. and, and the, the Marilyn Manson thing, I'm not sure if having um, his version of Sweet Dreams maybe fed into those rumors or something like that, but... Could could be. I mean, that was something I always, I always wanted Marilyn Manson's song in the in the movie. That was something I, I had tempted in very early. And, of course, uh, you know, the producers thought it was a great idea, so we were able to actually get the rights to it, so... yeah. And yeah. one, once the movie came out, um, was there any talks of, like you mentioned there, uh, you know, Vanicut's character and stuff, even nowadays, so many years on, people always talk about, you know, the backstory, the mental institution, and I believe you came up with a lot of that. Was there ever any talks of potentially doing maybe a, a prequel around that story or you doing um, another William Castle movie or anything like that? 
Uh, no, I mean, as far as I know, actually, in fact, they weren't even going to do the the sequel until I think I was at lunch with one of the guys at uh, Silver Pictures. I said, I don't understand why you're not making a sequel to House on Haunted Hill. It made a lot of money. <laughs> and, they, and the light bulb, the light bulb. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a yeah. that's one I was yeah. actually very surprised by that it took so long to. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess nobody just thought of it. You know, it was as simple yeah. as that. So. W- would you have done it if? Um, I don't know. You know, it, uh, making House on Haunted Hill was very hard for reasons that it shouldn't have been, and uh, having having to do with some of the people I needed, I had to work with on the film and. And I really just didn't feel like I wanted to do that, go down that road again. It was very difficult film to make. So, and, uh, you know, so, yeah. It's, so I don't think I, because I was actually supposed to make the, uh, see that uh, 13 ghosts and, and, uh, and I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so and I wasn't sure. I, I, I was like, I, I have it down here on my notes and I was going to bring it up and then I wasn't. That's another movie that um, I really enjoy as well, um, for different reasons. Just a f- I, I think maybe some of it's just nostalgia for me. Um, but I had I had heard a couple of times that you were uh, floating around that project at one point. So that is that is true. Yeah, I was actually contracted to to make that wow. film originally. Yeah. And uh, and I I had to say no I don't think I can do that so I would have yeah. loved to have to have seen you put your flair on it but I definitely do I have talked to so many people um, well, a lot of people like it and you know and and uh, the director I think did a good job on it so yeah, yeah but I think uh, a lot of people are probably going to be disappointed to hear that in a sense <laughs> that uh, just wanted to see more from you but I definitely have heard that story that you've kind of told there about a lot of people just maybe wanting to move away from projects or future things because of reasons and uh, too many cooks in the kitchen kind yeah, of a thing. Yeah. Was, um, which is unfortunate. Yeah it, was, yeah. it was very hard. I mean, you know, I, I you know, I got a bleeding ulcer on that movie and <laughs> yeah, it's just, there was just, you know, you, you don't want to die for a movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're passionate, but maybe not that passionate. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a couple of years passed in there and you brought in another movie which was a favorite of mine and i had seen it a long long time ago i think i picked it up in a blockbuster maybe years ago on dvd i have family in new york and we picked up this movie and for years i didn't even know that you had uh, made this movie and it's uh, a fear.com when when obviously everything died down from House on Haunted Hill, uh, how did it feel to come across that project and, and get excited again about something? Well, you know, it was a project that was brought to me and uh, I didn't really write the film. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that would be kind of a, a good experiment is to take a, a film, you know, which I hadn't written mm-hmm. and and do it. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it that film... I think I, what I wound up doing was making the darkest film in film history, probably on, on just about every level, potentially <laughs> graphically and and uh, you know, figuratively as well. Um, yeah, that came about, and and what happened was um, the producers wanted to shoot. It was really designed to be shot in New York, or at least to take place in New York, and they wanted to shoot it in Luxembourg, and they were going. Bill Luxembourg looks exactly like New York. I went, no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I got there, and I think because of the fact I was away from home, and uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of the things that I normally work with. It, it gave it a different atmosphere, and the uh, and also what happened is during production, my my mother passed away, wow. and and my cat died, so. I was in a very dark m- mood and uh, produced a very dark film, I think. So I doubt that I would make a film quite that dark these days. <laughs> it's, um, that, that's another one of those movies, though, that I feel like um, 
has gotten with a lot of your work it has a really strong cult following and has stuck around even all these years later i always see it pop up in different top 10 lists and different recommended and maybe even sometimes um i don't know if you're familiar with things like tiktok i've seen yeah. i've seen uh a lot of your movies pop up on these um you know best horror movie you might never have heard of or never seen and these <laughs> things get like millions of views uh, and I, I just think that's really cool to see that it can kind of live on and, and find its audience and have a really strong strong well, thank you you know it's it's uh it's interesting how films age it really is because uh you know, the certainly film fear.com didn't get a lot of love when it came out. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, I, I, I think I did some good work in it, it but it's, it's, uh, it was really hard to put a perspective on it just because of the things that had gone on during production. Yeah. But, um, it is interesting how films age, you know, some films, uh, people don't realize that forbidden planet was not a success when it came out you know, and wasn't revered until a lot later. And uh, a lot of, a lot of films are like that. Even Wizard of Oz, I don't think was as yeah. big a hit as it became later on. So it, it's interesting, uh, you know. Yeah. And those, I, those I, would I, be considered household like names now within those uh, genres, like triple A titles that people would, mm -hmm. I mean, you tell somebody about the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. It's like, Oh, it's the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. So, uh, but I'm glad I'm glad the film has aged well, and I, I and certainly I know that uh, House on Haunted Hill has gotten a good following, and and yes. uh, you know, so when when um, Fear dot com released, and like you said, you know, uh, some of the the reviews and critics came back, and it didn't get much love, and obviously you've gone through these personal, like awful things. What kind of headspace were you in at that point then? Was it just like, I want to park the movie business for a while and just kind of. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I think because the film was so dark, I think this, the major studios at that point weren't, uh, you know, uh, didn't want to know my name for a little while. Anyway, I was in, I was in director's jail there for a while. And, uh, and then after that, I, I had a number of films that came very close to getting made that just didn't happen. And look, I, I've spent probably 90% of my career in development hell, you know, films that, you know, were came this close to getting made. And that's what was going on after that. You know, I had a, a, a script called whispering glades, which I think was one of my best scripts. And, uh, you know, and it gave, came very close to being made by uh, several different companies and just didn't happen. And, uh, and some other scripts as well. And, and you probably have heard of, you know, the mirror and other films that, that, you know, that I, that I wanted to make, but you know, this is, that's just what happens. You know, you wind up in director in the, yeah. in, uh, in development prisons. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I've heard that story uh, a lot and there's actually a podcast um, called Best Movies Never Made and they talk to yeah. directors and writers all over the place about this and just hearing the stories of like you would not there's more movies that probably don't get made <laughs> than do which is crazy I, I think it, it, when I look back I'm because so many of those kind of, uh, books and, and, and podcasts I probably have the the, the, the uh, uh, <laughs> record for number of movies <laughs> <laughs> are on that list is, is there which a, is a which is a dubious honor yeah i know right <laughs> is, is there a project that still sits in your mind as something maybe the people don't know that like oh yeah i've got you know i mean there's you know certainly whispering glades is, is one of them which is uh it's a ghost story but it's a really cool one and and uh and then, of course, the mirror, which was a project I wanted to make with H.R. Giger, and of course he's yeah. passed away, but I still own the rights to his art. And and, and the uh, um, and there's a book that just just came out called uh, uh, Untold Horrors, which is covers it and so forth. And um, yeah, I mean, and you know, it's too bad the Dead Star turned into you know what it turned into because that that was a fun fun script, and you know. But, you know, this is what, what happens when you're, you know, I'll tell you a story. I, I was fortunate. I was on an airplane once 
Uh, this is in the early 90s. And there was an old guy sitting across from me and he, he had a German accent. And for some reason, we struck up a conversation mm -hmm. and he said, why don't you come over and sit next to me and talk to me? I said, OK, great. So I sat down and talked to him and I started talking about old movies. And, and I said, uh, he says, what kind of movies do you like? I said, well, I like a lot of German expressions, movies like Cabin Dr. Calgary and I like Metropolis. Mm -hmm. says, I was in Metropolis. I went, What? Yeah, I was in Metropolis, and uh, I uh, I uh, uh, wrote went to you know, to Hollywood later and made some movies for Hollywood, and I wrote uh, some movies for Universal. I went like what? You know, I wrote The Wolfman and House of Frankenstein, and and I went holy shit, you're Kurt C. Old Mac. He goes, and he beamed and stuff, and and wow. but to get back to what we were talking about, I, I said I said. Do you, I said, you've got all, you've written all these great scripts. I said, do you have any that uh, you haven't made? He says, I got the garage full of them. <laughs> yeah. And it's something I think people don't realize. Yeah. It's something I think people don't realize. Have you, yeah. um, I, I don't know how it works contractually and legally or whatever. Have you ever considered releasing some of the ideas or putting something together for your fan base? Uh, I'm, you know, I've thought about it. I really don't know the mechanism for doing that yet. In other yeah. words, should I put out a comic book? Should it be a novelization? I don't know, you know, so it's hard yeah. to say. It's something I think you people know? would uh, would eat up for sure. You've done an amazing episode uh, of Masters of Horror too, right after. Oh, well, well thank you. Not, I wouldn't say right after, but after uh, Fear.com. Again, another one of those things that crops up, and I think a lot of times maybe people don't know that that was your episode. Uh, <laughs> I would say one of the better episodes overall. And um, so that comes out, you know, you, you get contacted by Mick and you do that. And then this project pops up that you, so I want to get this right, you self-funded, wrote, and directed. Correct. Which, which would have been your last movie. Right. What What was it that made you so um, adamant that... I need to make this project. This movie needs to come out. I, I just had a feeling for it. I just had a, this, uh, uh, I just thought that it would make a really cool movie. And it was something that was a story that I thought would be really compelling and so forth. And I think it's a, it's a kind of misunderstood film uh, in, a, in a lot of ways uh -huh. uh, being that, you know, and look, you can never tell the audience how to feel about something, but I think, you know, I think that some people uh, have reacted to Danny's character as kind of creepy because he, you know, there's a scene that kept people kept saying, take it out, you know, where he, he's washing her and stuff like that. And, and uh, I think that people misunderstand what the movie's about. The movie's really about uh, a kind of pure romantic true love, which is uh, the fact that he had known her from when he, she was a little kid, a little girl mm -hmm. and met her and, and thought that he'd killed her and all of this stuff. And, and uh, if you watch the scene very carefully, he actually is never like lusting after her. He's like, it's more that he's just, he, he wants to protect her and take care of her. And, and he, as he suddenly realizes that what he's doing is like inappropriate or whatever, and he covers her all up and so forth. And, you know, but you know, people, you know, you can't tell an audience how to feel about something. So. Yeah. And it's, again, it's one of those movies that I think, um, I feel like maybe it's a little bit unfortunate it didn't get I would have liked to have seen it get a um a bigger release and maybe be represented a little bit better I think sometimes with the internet people run wild with these different things and then a lot of people unfortunately a lot of people are sheep so a lot yeah. of people <laughs> like to follow the trend yeah. and whatever and I, I definitely think this movie is going to be like your other work. I think it has serious potential to have that huge cult following, which is great because nowadays in modern day, I, I don't think when I say a cult anymore, you know, this we're not just talking about a couple of thousand people like cult followings now is, you know, <laughs> millions, tens of millions of people, um, yeah. which I think is great. But there's there's one question, I guess, that's been looming for the past 45 minutes or so <laughs> that I know people will will get on me if I don't ask is. So after this movie comes out, 
and a lot of people a lot of fans of yours consider that potentially your best work then you just step away from the limelight and step away from from making movies um i guess the two questions would be why that's one that everyone wanted me to ask and number two would be will we see you come back again and potentially do something well well, look i I, as far as stepping away i I think what it is is that uh, it's been harder for me in recent years to like put on the smiley face in the meeting (laughs) you know and uh it's just it's just difficult and it's um I was never a good liar, you know. <laughs> so like when yeah. when studio executives said, "Oh, no, we should uh, make this," uh, you know, why do you, this should be in a submarine, and uh, you know, it should. Uh, no, it's like it's yeah, it's very to hard. To... Oh yeah, that, oh that's a great idea, you know. Yeah. So it's been harder for me to do that, and and uh, which is probably why I made Parasomnia the way I did. You know, it was like, I, I, I didn't want to have to go through all of that, yeah. you know, song and dance of like trying to explain why this is a cool movie and all of that. And if you don't get it, you don't get it. So, uh, you know, but look, it's, um, uh, I have plans to make other films. Actually, I was going to make another film just before the pandemic s- struck and uh, we were actually in pre-production and then that just kind of went away. And so I'll probably have to go out and go back to raising money again and go through all of that. So, you know, it's, it's very hard, uh, you know, to raise money to make movies. And, but yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I think uh, uh, they probably won't, I'll, they'll have to, like, as they say, you know, pry the camera out of my dead hand. You know? I love that. I love that. <laughs> Um, you know, I I hope that you know that what my dying day will be cut. And that would go, be a, print it. That would be a good way to go out. <laughs> um, so I think that that's probably there's probably thousands of people right now that are given a. <sighs> thank God, <laughs> um, I, myself included, because that was something I personally as well did want to ask you. Uh, has there been have you had offers, I guess, in recent years or anyone reach out to your projects and been like, you know, do you want to come back? Would you like to be involved in this? Would you like to do it? Well, uh, not really, because I haven't really gotten myself out there. That, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm really, uh, I have to admit, I'm really bad at networking, you know. So, you know, there's definitely stuff I want to make, you know. And uh, of, of recent ilk, you know, there's been a lot of interest in the mirror. So hopefully that will something will come of that it's really hard to say but yeah i mean i am look i'm definitely up for making more stuff and it's just it's, there's the money's right and you know and money right being not pay me but to make the movie i've yeah. never actually cared much about how much i get paid uh in fact i've often paid for stuff on the sets myself because the producers didn't want to pay for it so uh uh but you know i i if the money's right to where you can make a good movie and that's all i'm ever i ever care about is if the movie can be true to itself and yeah. and i have a fighting chance to do something halfway decent that's all i care about yeah that so. i i love hearing that um <laughs> is there a i guess is there a direction or an avenue you would like to go down obviously now i guess the landscape has changed i mean you've got things like shutter uh, which I think yeah. you could probably do some really cool stuff with. Obviously, I think Netflix this week um, just bought the rights to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. And the new one that's already been filmed, they've shopped that. Um, with all these different streaming platforms and stuff, would you like to go down that avenue? Would you like to do a oh, huge... I, look, I, look, I think that's uh, uh, the future of movies. Yeah. I don't know the theaters are going to exist too much longer, at least not in any kind of mainstream way. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all for, you know, I actually, I've always enjoyed my television work. I, yeah. you know, television is actually, it's kind of fun because it, it's clean. It's like a real job. You know, they hire you, you come in, you do your job and you walk away. You know, it's like <laughs> feature films are much messier than that. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. I can yeah. imagine. And it, I guess it's, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned TV and I think a lot of times now people consume TV in the forms of those streaming apps. And I think it's really brought uh, a lot of shows back to life. Obviously, Shudder have done, um, you know, Tales from the Crypt again and 
and it's been hugely successful and there's all mm-hmm. these shows coming to Netflix and different things and I feel like it's maybe um it's a breath of fresh air for that format again. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and there's some exciting I, things. I agree with you. I mean, I think it's you know, I think it's great that all of this stuff is going down, and and uh, you know, in a way, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, like the VHS period. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. where you know back then there was a lot of need for content because of the VHS feeding the VHS machine, and now it's it's streaming. You've got they've got to have stuff to put on the stream. So, and streaming is is kind of good because, you know, all the television, I, I have never gotten, no, I say, what, I've only ever gotten one review on anything I've ever done on television. And that was that Tales from the Crypt episode, you know, that I did, long, you know, my first one. Other than that, you, you never hear of anybody saying about any of that stuff. And, and <laughs> Except a, for maybe Masters of Horror, I guess. I, another thing I like about, um, I guess the streaming platforms and stuff is, uh, you know, you could have something like fear.com released on Netflix or somewhere like that. And it brings it to a newer audience. I've seen that a lot recently where, mm-hmm. you know, something like uh, coming up to Halloween, you might have a, a house on haunted hill pops up. And a lot of the, the teenagers from nowadays, like tens of millions put this thing at number one on the Netflix charts and everybody seems to be talking about it and posting about it as if it's maybe a new movie and it gives mm-hmm. it a kind of a a resurgence and you know directors like yourself they kind of get brought back to probably where they should have been at the time exposure wise <laughs> and and stuff and I, I really like that I think that's the good that can come from it yeah no it's great it's great i'm I'm glad that uh people are re-examining a lot of these movies really because there's a lot of the sort of ones that sort of fell in between the cracks yeah. you know uh, uh just because they either didn't get a good release or whatever the reason so yeah yeah okay so a final few questions what are some of your favorite horror movies uh well gosh i mean uh, uh Going way back, I guess, you know, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and yeah. uh, 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 The Man Who Laughs and Faust and uh, um, going a little farther forward, uh, uh, The Black Cat with Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, one of my all-time faves. It's so demented. You couldn't make that movie today. Um, you know, and of course, Frankenstein and... Uh, uh, you know, the Karloff Frankenstein and then going into the fifties, you got, you know, creature from the black lagoon uh-huh. and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, the fly and uh, you know, a lot of that stuff. And then uh, in sixties, not too much in the sixties, except the hammer horror. I loved a lot of the hammer yeah. horror films, you know, I like the Dracula, the original mm-hmm. Christopher Lee, uh, Peter Cushing, Dracula, and a lot of the hammer things. Uh, and then House of Dark Shadows is a movie that I think is should get more love than it gets. It's a great vampire film, and not very many people know about it. It's one of the all-time best vampire films. And uh, and then uh, more recently, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, of course, Texas Chainsaw is a masterpiece, and uh, Alien, which is such a masterpiece. I, it's, it's amazing. And uh, And then you know, uh, Dark City more recently. Mm-hmm. And, uh, then, and, and then much more recently, so I liked It Follows a lot. I thought, thought that was really quite, good, a, yeah. quite a good film. Yeah. The, it doesn't get as many props as it deserves. No, and I feel like that's another movie again that uh, it, it crops up from time to time, but I think maybe in the future might actually start to get the the proper recognition it deserves you mentioned a movie there that i always tell people about and it haunted me for years the image was uh the man who laughs Ugh. i don't know if people have uh some a lot of people are not familiar with this i had <laughs> i would have nightmares about that for years that was a, a something i had seen way too young it was such a it's such a good movie. It's probably the problem is a lot of people don't watch silent movies because they're silent. Yeah. And all I can I can quote Peter Laurie again, you're fat bloated idiots. <laughs> <laughs> silent movies are some of the best movies ever made. And that is is a tour de force movie. I mean, uh, 
Conrad Fight's performance is amazing. And of course, it spawned the Joker. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be the Joker if it wasn't for that movie. Yep. And uh, um, my wife, who hadn't seen it, I ran it for her recently in the last few months, actually. And she was blown away by it. She said, wow, I had no idea this would be such an emotional film. And uh, it's really quite a good movie. It is. It's very and, good. Yeah. It's very good. It doesn't get talked about. Um, very much. Another silent movie is not a horror film, but if you ever get a chance to watch Sun Sunrise by Morneau, it's it's just a killer movie. It's it's kind of like an Alfred Hitchcock kind of film, and it's really Sunrise. really wonderful. Okay, I need to keep a note of that one. Um, so th- this is something I always ask, and again, sometimes maybe it puts people on the spot. Uh, a lot of people look for advice. Now, it's not specific to, uh, I guess, directing per se, because I know you've had many interests. Um, you know, you know your music, you know your films, you know your TV, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. What advice would you give to someone who has a dream like that um, and and trying not to give up? I think nowadays, uh, a lot of times we're set up to, you know, you, you leave school, you get your job and you just shut up and that's what you do. Well, uh, yeah, I, I look, the thing about it, if you want to be a filmmaker, what I, my advice is, is twofold. I would say, first of all, do not give up. Just don't take no for an answer. Just when somebody says something negative, just let it go and just move on. You know, now that does, it doesn't mean don't take what they said in into account. You should think about it. And, you know, if it's, there's something valid, you'll know, yeah. but just don't take no for an answer and just keep moving on. My other advice is when, and this is a, this is one I wish somebody had told me back in the day. If when the opportunities come and somebody offers you something, say yes, say yes to everything. And even if you don't want to do it, have your agent say, Oh, he's busy. <laughs> Okay. But if you say, if you tell them the truth and you just tell them you don't like their project, they'll never come back to you on anything else. So uh, just say yes to everything and don't worry about it. Half of them is not going to happen anyway. So Yeah, keep all your options open. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, people will think you're, that you're hard to get along with or you're, uh, you know, troublesome or something. So, yeah. But yeah, just just don't take no for an answer. Just Just do it. Yeah. Is there a prop in your collection that's, your prized possession and is there a prop that you would love to have that you do not? Well, let's go. Cause there's always props I'd like to have, I guess. Um, I'd like to have one of the Martian war machines from 1953, the <laughs> war of the worlds, yeah. uh, you know, and I don't believe that they're not out there. I still think that they're buried at Paramount underneath some sound stage. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's the main one I'd like to have. What was the other part of it? Um, what's your favorite piece you have? And it doesn't even have to be value wise. It can be like you said, something that you personally just love. Um, well, I really like. You know, I have, I have one of the spacesuits from Alien, and that's that's Amazing. sort of something I really uh, yeah. uh, I like a lot because I really I think Alien's just a wonderful film and. And I had the opportunity to spend some time with Ridley Scott on the set of one of his films, and and uh, I learned a lot from that. So yeah, it's kind of important. That's amazing. I remember yeah. seeing. Um, I normally take a trip to Orlando every year for Halloween Horror Nights, and they have a display in their horror makeup show, and it has a, a bust of the uh, mutant head from This Island Art. And I had watched the YouTube, and I remember thinking, I was like, because I collect different busts and things like that and i remember seeing this thing and being like that is so badass i would love <laughs> to bring that back home yeah. and then i seen obviously some of your collection and you have that in your collection well i'll tell you the story of that is is uh, i got that when i was at don post studios when i first got there um i i don't think they knew what they had there was a big uh, plaster looked like a vat sitting there and I, I rummaged through it and it was being used for a waste can. And I like opened it up and I'm like, this is the original mold to the, the wow. mutant from this Island earth. This is not 
something to be doing with this. So I cleaned it all up and then took a cast out of it, you know, and, and told them what they had, you know, and of course that's, it was later taken proper care of, but yeah. So yeah, that's the cast out of the original mold. You have been, I, I this is something I think that this would have highlighted this past hour, but you have been involved in some of like the biggest things within the horror genre that are not even your projects, i.e. the Captain Kirk slash Michael Myers thing and and this story. Um, is it true that you work with or have worked with in recent years with Trick or Treat Studios? Yeah, I, I uh, licensed them some of my characters from uh, from Scared to Death, the Sinjinor, and and then another character which I which was never in a movie, just a thing that I had sculpted it was my one of my earlier sculpts and stuff like that and. Uh, yeah, I've had the pleasure actually of, of uh, collecting a lot of cool stuff, and I and fortunately being able to save some stuff from from oblivion. You know, um, Bob Short, who you, Robert Short, you might know as an effects guy. Uh-huh. You know, uh, um, he and I were fortunate enough to become friends with a guy at MGM at the time when they were it was getting sold and to Lorimar, and they were basically throwing tons of stuff out and we became friends with the head of of construction and and uh we got a, a pass for two i think it was two or three days to go through mgm any place we wanted to go wow. he gave us a pass it was like a, the gold card and he said whatever you find bring it back to me and if, if i can sell it to you i will and we went through and we found tons of stuff we loaded up a truck with it and uh, he sold us the whole thing. I think it was like 350 bucks. I got stuff from Forbidden Planet. There was a, uh, you know, we could have actually even had, they had the uh, Wizard's Machine from Wizard of Oz. Wow. But it was, so, it was so big, there was no place to put it. So I had, they even offered me the bottom of the flying saucer from Forbidden Planet. The whole, I mean, talking about the life-size one. You know, and I went... <laughs> Okay, what would I do with that? So, that's so crazy. some things unfortunately had to go. But and yeah. and I guess for people who don't know, so when you say, uh, you know, they were getting rid of or they were thrown out, do you mean genuinely like this stuff was going into yeah, trash? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first day I got there, um, the first thing I, I I thought of was the 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 the, the dome thing from Forbidden Planet that had the uh, the spaceship in it that was the navigation yeah, yeah. center to the C fifty seven D, and it was, it was big, but it had been used in a number of films, and that was the first thing I asked about. And the guy said, "Day late, Dollar Short we bulldozed it yesterday." Oh wow! So they they literally had a yard in the back. They were building the UA building on the on the back lot, uh, and they. And the, it was actually sound the stage. Or no, I'm sorry, uh, lot one, and they were uh, taking stuff out of the prop department and the s- construction and throwing it in the in the center. And they had a bulldozer running over it, and it wow. uh, that's that's where it is. It's under landfill someplace. So, that is crazy. Yeah. That's so, so but we were look. We were fortunate to get the stuff we got. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. Okay, final question. Why horror and what does it mean to you? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I guess probably uh, I've always liked the dark side of things. I just like, you know, seeing what's, you know, behind the, the shadows. And it probably, grew, probably comes to the fact that I grew up in a small town, which was very much like a David Lynch movie. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was like, you know, it had this persona of being like everything's like fine but there was always like creepy things going on yeah yeah shadows you know (laughs) and uh i guess that sort of stuck with me and i guess maybe that sort of shaped plus take my mom showing taking me to see creature from the black lagoon when i was seven years old or something (laughs) yeah yeah but yeah i just love the sort of milieu yeah it's it's hard to explain sometimes because sometimes people ask me and and I, you know, I always refer to it as like a, my happy place or a safe place, and and this is something that that some of your work uh, has actually done for me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times, it it, it goes underappreciated the power that some of this art can have mm-hmm. on people's lives. You know, when you're in a bad spot, or you know, a lot of us, including mm-hmm. me, use this 
some of these things as a, an escape, you know, you yeah. get to escape into your favorite movie, back into that world and kind of forget about the, well, the I, real I know, horror. I, I don't know if you, if you this way, I was always a daydreamer when I was a yeah. little kid. So you, you probably were too. And yeah. Yeah. What are, well, what are your favorite films all the time? You know, five, five top films. And you don't have to mention one of mine. <laughs> yeah, well, it, I'm, and I'm not even saying this just because we're we're having this conversation. But House on Haunted Hill for me is definitely in there. Um, the man who laughs has potential. I have watched that so many times. Um, Halloween, uh-huh. Halloween is probably in there. Um, have you ever seen The Black Cat? The Black Cat, I have not. Boris Karloff, Bill Lugosi, 1934, Edgar Ulmer. The Black Cat. That's something I need to... Uh, yeah, it's like when it's in it's in my top five, just for sure. It, oh, and sorry, it's, it's good. Because it, it's so demented. Okay. I need to check that out. Um, funny enough, actually, and it's a strange one, um, and a lot of people give me shit for this, is uh, the Blair Witch Project. Okay. Um, I think just probably more so for the lore created and just kind of the whole... Uh, look, I like the movie as well, but I like the whole um, idea of it and what went into it and they created this whole world. It just felt kind of fresh and different. And Well, it was, yeah. I mean... Um, and I would say... last one phantom of the opera the original or the yeah the phantom the yeah 1926 yeah phantom of the opera would be would yeah. be up there for me as well i think now you see it's one of those it, questions when someone puts me on the spot i could probably think of about a hundred movies that i would be oh, like yeah, oh, i'm sure this, this, i'm this, sure this. no i guess yeah it's hard to, it's hard to narrow it down it's in, uh, interesting you mentioned phantom of the opera uh Recent, maybe recent, probably five, six years ago, I met Carla Lemley, who wow. was in Phantom of the Opera, and that was like uh, that was like amazing for me to meet somebody who was in a silent movie. She was the lead ballerina in uh, Phantom of the Opera. Wow, she was on the set. I'll tell you a quick story. She told me she was on the set when Cheney did the unmasking. The, the, the unmasking scene when uh, yeah, yeah. Mary Philbin Mary Philbin pulls the mask off, uh-huh. and she said that Cheney came out wearing a black hood so that she couldn't so Mary Philbin couldn't see what he yeah. looked like so that the unmasking would be her real reaction. So when they rolled cameras and, and Carla Lemley was on the set watching this, when they rolled camera, uh, she pulls the mask off. He turns around. She sees his face and faints dead away. Really? <laughs> and, and Lon Chaney senior, he, he's so upset that he's like scared or so much. He walks over to her and he's like patting her, trying to bring her back. And the director came over and grabbed him and said, Lon, you, you better not be the first thing she sees when she comes to you. <laughs> you know what? Um, a lot of those movies and a lot of the ones you've spoke about, um, silent movies and from way way back i it's something i would love to see um them try to reintroduce again and i don't mean a remake but i would love to see them get um streaming releases or something like that i know it would be a lot more uh cult i guess but i would love to see some of that stuff be um i'll I'll tell you i've really examined i think one of the problems that silent movies have the, the people don't that they're re- reacting to and they don't realize that that's what they're reacting to is not that they're fact in black and white or that they're silent, but usually the scores are terrible. Yeah. The scores that they put to them are really awful. And I've, I've taken some of those movies and like put better scores to them and they really play amazing. Uh, and uh, also there's a, uh, there's a short film you might want to watch that I think is astounding. And it was uh uh, Fall of the House of Usher, 1928. It's a short. It's only like 12 minutes long. But it was by uh, two guys in their carriage. They built it and they did it in their carriage house in New York. And uh, Melville and uh, Watson. And it's, it's, it's very much like Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And it's, it's wonderful. 
I actually think I have a poster for that somewhere around okay. here. Um, and it was one of those things where I don't think I realized really what it was at the time. I was like young and I I'm I was very visual when I was younger and I had seen some horror movies and stuff. And then I always loved artwork and I would look at something and be like, okay, I want that. Or mm-hmm. I might even want a movie when I was young and there was no way I was going to be allowed to watch it, but I would just want it for the artwork. Right. Um, and yeah. I actually think I have a poster from that somewhere. It sounds very familiar. Um, well, it's been an absolute pleasure. A, a genuine, yeah. genuine, um, and this is something I wanted to keep in the recording. It's been a, an honor, really. Um, I've talked to a lot of people over the last couple of years, um, and, and this has been the one that I've been the most excited for. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, to talk to you and get to meet you, whether it's virtually or or not. Well, it's been great fun, and I really want to thank you for all your support and the fact that you, you know, have enjoyed my work and and uh, uh, it's been great fun chatting with you. And I hope we get to do it again soon. Yeah, hopefully, um, you know, if you've got some projects coming up, maybe we'll get to do it again and have some cool announcements or talk about some newer stuff. Is there anything that you have got to, I guess, plug or? Anywhere where people can find you or see some cool stuff? Um, not not so much at the moment, but I, I would say, you know, pick up the book, The Untold Horrors, which it just came out okay. or it's just about to come out. Mm-hmm. I think it's on Amazon. I think you can get it on Amazon. Uh, and that's got some stuff on the Mirror Project and so probably some of my other ones as well. And uh, yeah, but I want to wish everybody to uh, a, a good day and ho- and stay scary. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll I'll put the links uh, for that down below. So when anybody is listening to this, if you just click into the description, the link to the book will be there. Um, and also, uh, William is on Instagram at the minute under William Malone Director. Um, so if you do want to see some cool shots of uh, some stuff you mightn't have seen before and cool things and do not go and argue with him about this is not the original or this is the original. Um <laughs> So, yeah, it's been a pleasure, and uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Evil wears many masks, but pure horror wears only one. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as $1. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise, only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you.